our experiment um, was conducted at the Ashley Dean Dryland Farm at Lincoln University. Uh, so it's a really low rainfall environment with stony shallow soils. We looked at four different pasture mixes, perennial ryegrass with subclover, perennial ryegrass with subclover and balanza, and these two same legume combinations with coxfoot. Um, it was grazed by ewes and lambs for the first five years as part of a live weight gain experiment and spring yield was also measured. Um, then for the following two years, it was uh, grazed as part of the commercial farm. In the eighth year, I had the opportunity to come on and measure the spring yield once again. So here are our spring yield results. Coxfoot had higher yields than ryegrass in all years, um, apart from in year one as Coxfoot is a slower establishing species. So ryegrass really just could not persist in this dry land environment. Plantain was high in the ryegrass-based pastures as it was lacking that competition from the ryegrass, so it, it filled that niche that ryegrass would have been in. Um, the plantain persisted for five years, but then did have a bit of a drop off in year eight. The weed grasses invaded the ryegrass, the weed grasses invaded the ryegrass pastures from year three, and these got progressively worse until year eight when the majority of um, yield was from the weed grasses. And these grasses included vulpia, brome, and barley grass. Subclover yield was quite variable between years, and this was just dependent on the timing and amount of the autumn rainfall to get that um, germination from the subclover. And total spring yield was also dependent on rainfall. So these values here are the autumn to spring rainfall for that year. So you can see in year five, the highest rainfall of 580 mils yields were above 6,000, compared to year eight with half that yield, half that rainfall, and yields of three to 4,000. So here are some photos of the pastures. This is in spring of year five with coxfoot on the left and ryegrass on the right. So the sowing species component, so the grass, clover, and plantain, uh, made up 85% of the coxfoot pastures at this time and only 70% of the ryegrass pastures. Here they are again in spring of year eight. The coxfoots had a decline in sowing species to 60%, but the ryegrass-based pastures have had an even steeper decline and they only make up 30% of the pasture. And as you can see from the photo, most of the grass that is left is um, weed grasses like vulpia that the livestock aren't too keen on grazing. We also looked at the pasture quality in year eight. So coxfoot had a reasonable ME, um, only a little bit lower than ryegrass, but better protein and quite comparable fiber. The unsown grasses also had um, surprisingly a reasonable ME, uh, but higher fiber, and even though the ME was quite good, the livestock just weren't interested in eating it. Um, Subclover had high protein, about 27%. Um, and along with its nitrogen fixation, it's a really important component of dryland pastures. So in conclusion, the coxfoot-based pastures were the most persistent in the dryland environment, and in year eight, the, uh, the sowin species were 60% of the yield. The plantain persisted for five years, um, and it was a suitable companion for subclover, so this is an area that could be explored further for dryland pastures. The shallow soils meant that the yields were reliant on the seasonal rainfall, so in a dryland environment, you're always gonna get a variation between years. Um, and the unsown grass weeds predominantly invaded the ryegrass-based pastures. And just acknowledgement to our sponsors, thank you. <laughs> it was very fast. <laughs>